Hey, what's up, everyone? What's I'm Rachel up? Martin. What's up? This is Sean Barrett. Um, I'm the owner and vintner of Oceano Wines, and this is our tasting room live. Our guest this evening is Sean Barrett, co-founder of Doc to Dish, the first uh, New York State uh, community-supported. Um, what do you say? It community-supported fishery. Yeah. And and you're located in Montauk. Yes, that is so yes. awesome. I can't tell you like how um, impressed I am with what you're doing with Doc to Dish. And sustainability is important for us too as grape growers and wine producers. I'm also very passionate about fish and, and seafood and sea life. I'm on a boat. So I was trying to show up, you know, for our live stream, authentic. Cool, um, cool. So how, how have you been? It's been a long time. Good. Yeah, yeah. It's been a minute, Rach. I think the last time we hung out was at a seafood restaurant uh, <laughs> where my buddy Rudy used to work, right? Nora Jones's favorite hangout down in the West Village of New York City. I'm trying to think of the name yeah. of that place. It was called, oh, Aqua Grill. Yeah, the no longer Aqua Grill. It yeah, closed yeah, yeah. during the pandemic. Yeah, 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 exactly. A lot of things and did, unfortunately, but um, unfortunately, yeah. But you are um, a veteran restaurant industry restaurant owner, and tell me because we haven't seen each other since then. It's been a minute. And yeah. I, it's been a minute, and I hadn't started Oceano Wines. So no, you're still boxwood back in the day. Yeah, yeah. So, so many uh, things have, have changed and evolved. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, you know, really, Dr. Dish, if you look at the original blueprint, Rach, like we kind of borrowed a lot from the farming space, right? From, um, from community supported agriculture. Now, going back like 10 ish years, uh, it's, it has been a minute, but, um, yeah, Dr. Dish turned 10 this year. And so if I go back to the beginning and the roots, um, you know, we had kind of been doing fundamentally Dr. Dish type activities since we were kids, right? Like the very basics of like what you caught that day dictated what was for dinner that night. Um, right. And I feel like a lot of kids who grew up on a coast or around a fishery or fishing towns get to have those experiences early on. Um, and so they're formative, right? And I think that I kind of was raised up and and had a vision and idea and, and a experience of what seafood was like. But over the years, um, we watched that change drastically um, over the 80s, 90s, early 2000s to these crazy statistics um, where where suddenly the new you know in New York and in the country at large, um, our, we were importing like over 90% of our seafood from like unknown places right. all, all over the planet. So basically, yeah, we just went on a quest to see if we could try to um, find a more sustainable uh, way to do that. And Rach, what do they say? Like necessity is the mother of invention. So um, that's right. Yeah. So we, we, we basically looking back in the rear view mirror now, Rach, we really went to a lot of different thought leaders and borrowed the best ideas from a few different places and kind of kind of put those together um, to come up with a, with a Dr. Dish, uh, you know, the format. Very little in there was actually authentically new as much as it was a few different things that we had pulled together from the agricultural space, from farmers, from some chefs, um, and then kind of like melded these things together to create a, a whole new system of seafood sourcing, which ended up um, taking off kind of like a rocket ship. Right, I yeah. see that. You've gotten a lot of attention and a lot of press. And what, what I really, I was taken by is that it's not just about the fish, the fishing, but it's also about the fishermen. Right. And the the um, the trade of being a, a fisherman, and you know that's an artisanal um, talent, and it's it's a talent, but it's also a learned trade. And I think it's great to keep you know that industry alive, and those people you know allow them to continue to thrive. Um, and what I I was watching your videos, and I saw that you have is it you have restaurants that pay you in advance 
for the cat. So for every month, do they pay you? How does that go? Yeah, yeah, Th that's such a good question. And a lot of people ask that same question, like how exactly did you arrange it that um, you the restaurants pay in advance? And not only that, but they're also willing to accept uh, whatever is, you know, we have a very catch strict of the criteria. Day, right? Yeah, it's a true revival of catch <laughs> of the day. But I think our our model, you kind of have to force that um, uh, you yeah, because American, our culture is just so accustomed to on demand or what you want, Amazon it, and you have it the next day. So we're very demand based culture. So our model and most of the models we see for really, truly sustainable regenerative practices are um, there, you know, it's what is the ecosystem bringing for you instead of you telling the ecosystem what you want, right? So, um, but a lot of that, so the restaurants paying in advance, that's all built off the blueprint of CSAs, of community supported agriculture, which yeah. especially like some, you know, certain sectors of the economy suffered greatly during the pandemic and it's, re it's really still, we're not, and we're still in it, you know? So, um, but CSAs and community supported agriculture flourished and blossomed. And we were blessed, Rachel, to have on the Eastern end of Long Island is, um, it's called Quail Hill Farm. And it's the, it's the oldest CSA in New York. It's like the, one of the top two oldest in the country. Um, this really amazing farmer there named Scott Chasky, uh, who's like a farmer poet, but he, he kind of started <laughs> CSAs in our country. Um, he wrote an amazing book called This Common Ground, which I, I read, and it's like life on an organic farm, but also explains the mechanics and the spiritual nature of a CSA. Um, and so that concept, which is radically different than the marketplace that people are accustomed to, are actually becoming a member, like signing up for a membership um, of a local farm and agreeing to receive what, what the farmer is growing and what the season is providing. So what's most local, what's most seasonal, what's most abundant, and really those same fundamental building blocks, we just borrowed from community supported agriculture and created mm -hmm. a community supported fishery. But the truth of that story is um, that we then had like a holy smokes moment where we realized like there's a lot of economic headwinds in in the in that space that made it very difficult to manage until dan barber at blue hill came along i'm sure you're familiar with dan's work yeah um, of course yes so i had a, a good friend of mine used to work with him in the restaurant industry and he was like hey dude dan would like to meet you and talk to you about this uh, no. community sport of fishery. That's yeah, awesome. yeah. It was pretty cool. So if you see Rach, like those kind of, those stories where like the guy goes and knocks on the back of the kitchen door um, and the chef answers the door, like that was, that, that was authentically how Dan and I met. I had like a box of like speared sea bass, like really beautiful fish. And I drove all the way from Montauk to his farm in Westchester. Um, but he really then single-handedly kind of we created the first restaurant supported fishery program. Mm. Now looking back, that was ever, you know, it was the first um, ever. And so then that model, Dan reached out to like Thomas Keller and San Fran, Michael Simarusti in LA and all the New York chefs, right? So at that time, you know, Eric Repair, Michael Anthony, all the top chefs suddenly, Dan, when Dan Barber calls and was like, hey man, I have a, <laughs> you know, I have an, an in for, re the, a lot of them are interested in quality. Um, so it took right. some massaging and stuff. Our quality always blows them away, but it takes um, it takes some time for everyone to get used to like not being able to demand anything, like just have to be willing right. to re receive it. So, but I think that's kind of like really inspires the creativity of actually cooking, you know. So it, you have to be really agile when it comes to that and super creative when you think of flavor profiles of the fish and different ways to cook it. So I'm, I think it's incredible and I love to cook and you know, fish is my thing. And so I'm always concerned about sourcing, you know, where are these fish coming from? Uh, I try to eat as closely to home as possible. And I, I noticed on your website, you list all of the uh, fisher, the fishermen and women, I'm sure, uh, fishery. that you work with the fishers, yeah. whatever you call it, you know, but, um, so there are about 14 or so. Do you have more than that? Or is it limited to that? Do you, yeah. Is there a threshold for you? Um, so we do have our, like on the website, if you go to the meet the fleet section, you'll see, I think it's 
I, we may have expanded that recently, Rage, but there's somewhere in that ballpark, 14, 18, around there. Um, but those are also, um, a lot of fishermen are shy and don't really want to be, you yeah. know. Um, okay, yeah. <laughs> their business kind of like, so but that's kind of like, uh, you know, our, our more, our, our, our uh, you know, more forward thinking kind of sector of the fleet. And, the, but I they really it. do. They do appreciate. I, yeah, I want to like, know the people behind it, right? You know, you want. I want to yeah. feel as connected as possible. Exactly, Rich. Because what happens in like any, we always look at the chain of custody of how long the chain is. Like when, if something is starting at the beginning of a long chain of custody, and you don't know the person at the beginning, there's really no incentive for that person to take care of it, or they just like it's kind of like hot potato. And you only really know the right. most recent person in the chain who gave it to you, right? So by yeah, that makes eliminating sense. that whole chain and just connecting you directly to the source, um, this kind of, you know, a series of things happen where, you know, our know your fisherman mantra, we're constantly trying to connect the identities and the personalities and the actual person to the end consumer. And, and two things on both sides of that um, equation happen. First, the, the fishermen are like, oh, wait, my name and my family, my good family name is going to travel to this person who I know. So suddenly there's a cascading effects of like quality ice. We do a lot of ecojime, like just as you're getting fishermen's fish. So the same fish that a fisherman would bring home for his family is now going to the chefs and other parts of the community. So that's often a mind blower for people who've never had that type of quality before that they're just like, oh my God, like, what did you do to this? And we're like, Actually, that's the beauty of it. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'm I'm in uh, I'm in Maine right now, and um, I'm in Booth Bay Harbor, so not too far north of Portland. And you know, you see the fisher fishing boats all over, and the fishermen bringing home, you know, the catch and bringing them to restaurants. And um, so it's for me because I've always lived on the coast that's a, it's a normal sighting but there are people who've never lived at the coast and their fish has always been brought to them from some unknown place right. and they don't ever think about it you know so how, are you reaching those people um you know in the inner inland as well that's yeah i would say that that's the hardest part for us reach also because we subscribe to this kind of our food miles are really important to us and fish can if it's going to travel far it has to travel fast and that almost has to always be by airplane which really then defeats especially in the era of climate change a uh, climate crisis as soon as a fish goes on an airplane it kind of like becomes really right. sustainable and the carbon footprint right. is just crazy so that you just put your finger on like the exact like one of the most difficult challenges we have is how do we penetrate into the non-coastal states um, and, and maintain quality, freshness, transparency, a small chain of custody. Once again, you can get into places like that, but um, you're, you're often entering into a longer chain of custody and that's where all the troubles seems to happen. So no, I, will, I mean, we admit to our successes and our failures and one of, we've gone and set up Dr. Dish programs all around coast from all throughout Florida, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Vancouver, down into like, Costa Rica, Central America, Fiji. We've helped people create these programs in Cape Town, South Africa, London. Now has Whoa. like, yeah, the concept. I didn't and the know model, that. Yeah, all cool. over the place. But what we and know that's kind of our strength is being able to go out and teach this model and get it started elsewhere. But our weakness is actually distance. How do we get like so? Mm -hmm. And each of those will only um, service a hundred and fifty mile radius around the harbor. So if you're not in that radius, like that is the great puzzle for us. Like, how do we solve this, like the distance problem? Um, and we're still working on it. Yeah, no, all good, you know. Well, I can appreciate what you guys are doing because, you know, for wine, it there's oceans, Ooh, so you know, really into the ocean, right? Yes, and those yes. are seahorses. <laughs> yeah, um, but, you know, we, we prefer to sell directly to you know the wine lover and um because it's the same thing it's the the short shortening the the chain right so selling direct is always the best way and it benefits the farmers as well you know to to go yeah, direct definitely reach so and i see you doing a lot of this work too where it's you're putting a focus on the farmer and like 
the, the the farmer's name and identity traveling with the wine. And this is interesting. This is Dan Barber's brother, David, pointed this out to us, David Barber. This kind of really interesting thing happens in, we couldn't um, really explain it, but it happens again and again and again, where if people, it's almost like their imagination gets turned on. If you give them the name of the wine grower and the farm and the vineyard and explain like the origin details while they're having that wine, so it's obviously yeah. top, the best quality. I mean, you know, the best grapes. You've got all the top tier things, but um, but actually knowing and being able to visualize the face of that person and like it enhances the experience in a way that people will say is is di different than when they're cut off from the source and they don't know, you know, the, the maybe they know the region or the zone or the state or even the vineyard, but there's no person attached at the origin. Um, right. So we, we saw that happen again and again and again with with Dr. Dish Seafood, where people would just be blown away by like um, all of the, you know, the freshness, the quality, all that. But the, knowing that this was Captain Bruce Beckwith, for, you know, Montauk, his boat, a little bit about his family, just in, engaged their imagination, their ability to kind of like envision this. And then we kept hearing again and again that that created an experience around the fish or the wine or the the mm -hmm. vegetables, whatever it may be, that Dan and, and his brother David are, will regularly talk about how um, that source information, having that like clarity to where this material, this ingredient began, is really just creates a unique experience that can't be replicated without that. Yeah, abs absolutely. And our vineyard is a mile and a half from the ocean. So it's right outside of Pismo Beach um, in the Ooh. county of San Luis Obispo. So our wines, not, not surprisingly, pair perfectly with seafood because, you know, they it's a cool climate, coastal, marine fog, you know, every every evening to morning. So it's like what grows together goes together. together. You know, it really, yeah. yeah, it really holds true with this, especially with our wine. But have you? With your experience with Dr. Dish, have you seen any fish get dangerously, um, uh, um, I guess, fished so that they they are near extinction or or into some sort of point where you're afraid it won't return? Yeah, in other countries, I have right, like in Central America, there's definitely, and out in the distant Pacific, working in Fiji, there's certain reef fish, and and there's different species. Um, that not only from fishing and overfishing but now, but climate change and migration shifts are causing like dramatic differences in um, in formerly native species that are all migrating up to cooler waters. Um, but the good news in this whole space reach is, and without going too deep down a rabbit hole of how this happened, um, but in like the 1980s, 70s, we passed this sweeping legislation in the United States, uh, the Madison Stevens Act, that really totally created a, a, a regulatory framework around commercial fisheries in the United States that's now viewed as like a beacon around the world as the best way to manage your species. So um, what we've seen in the United States is actually a renaissance and a resurgence of a lot of local species. So these species that were once overfished or their biomass stocks were very low, codfish is a good example of that. Um, now you have um, the commercial fisheries in the United States are literally like the strictest and most complex, but also most effective in the world. So what we're seeing now in the U.S., and that's another big part of why we're always advocating, like, know your fishermen, source locally, directly from community source seafood, because if it's U.S. wild seafood, it's sustainable. We're not allowed to catch species that are threatened or endangered or things like that. And I think that's right now... now. Yeah, yeah. In the mid-Atlantic yeah. where we are, you're up in, in New England. But if you take those two sectors, so the way the government does it is they break the country into different zones. And now, because there's obviously species of fish that travel between the zones. So all the states have separate types of state level um, regulation, but the federal government manages um, all these species. And, and right now, I think the number is like 26, just in the mid-Atlantic where we are. Um, fish stocks in the last like 10 years that have been rebuilt to a population status that's quote unquote sustainable. And what that means is that their biomass, the level of those fish that are in the ocean, if you can imagine the way that the, the analogy they use is like keeping a bank account 
balance a principal amount and only like living off the interest. The commercial fisheries in the U.S. can only harvest off of above the targeted biomass, so that that the biomass always remains the same. And theoretically, the way it works is that future generations will have the same access to this resource or or better access. So it's kind of a it's a really good story in U.S. fisheries right now. Yeah, Global, globally, it's a scary story when you get out into you see these horrible stories of slavery in the supply chain and people using like cyanide bombs and hand grenades over wow. reefs. yeah yeah terrible fishing Stuff tactics with people. yeah yeah right but well, the U- um, US, if you're if you're sourcing local u.s seafood you can feel confident that that is like the most sustainable seafood in the world oh that's great to know and you have a subscription right so can a, you know, someone like me go on the website and sign up for a subscription. Tell me how that works. Well, we're sold out. That's a big piece. We've been sold <laughs> Wait, out. Wait, what? Actually. Yeah. Um, our community sports fishery, it's, well, if you live in Montauk or around uh, the East End, we also have a brick and mortar, uh, Peterson Seafood, oh. which operates the Dr. Dish program for locals. Um, but our restaurant program, because we also had in New York, Rachel, we had like big institutions like the google corporation like they have a huge campus yeah that became members and kind of took up a lot of our yeah a lot of our (laughs) bandwidth so to speak so um so right now we're still on a on a pause on a lot of operational pause in a lot of different ways but our community sport fishery program um is maxed and and oversubscribed uh typically but you can access dr dish fish from peterson seafood in Montauk in town. So when are you coming to town? That's another big question. Are you um, as as soon as possible? <laughs> I'll be back in New York on the, the sixth and then I'll be in and around the city and out in the Hamptons uh, during the summer. So will it's like catch up, you know, definitely, in Montauk definitely. and hang yeah, out. Well, you you have unlimited as whatever you'd like. You can have uh, Thanks, we'll make John. sure that you're totally taking care of and yeah we're super excited and grateful thanks for um for having us on tonight too this is a really cool way to get the story well i love i mean straight up i love what you're doing i have so much respect for it and it's near and dear to my heart as well and since we're both involved in things somewhat in the ocean i thought you know it'd be another great way to reconnect with you um, so tell me then, is there, what is, do you go out and fish as well? Cause I've seen some videos of you on the boat. Are you a fisherman? No, I'm do not a commercial know? fisherman no. and I'm not no. like, a, and so over the years and I've been like, I'll see my name in certain places. They're like, Sean, commercial fisherman. I'm like, Tech, no, I'm no, not, I'm oh. not, no. <laughs> so I operate a community sport of fishery and I am a, like, a, you know, I've, fish. I know how to fish. I've been out fishing for every conceivable type of fish you could imagine. Um, but the way, you know, the way you kind of um, designate if someone is a farmer or if they're a fisherman is like, what what do they do for income? And none of my income comes directly from catching fish. So I operate an entity that's like, um, you know, directly, it's called direct marketing, like cr- directly connects, but it's a separate business. And so no, I'm not a commercial uh, fishermen. Um, and I will say this, a really exciting thing that we're starting up, uh, Rachel, we've been working on it for a long time, but now the kelp and seaweed story is really starting to kick into. Okay. Yeah. So I'll catch up, but this could be yeah, I'm into it. At, a, at a later time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we're starting to bring to a lot of the vineyards and the farms, basically we're farming kelp, um, and using certain species of seaweeds to do soil amendments. I mean, kelp as food. Up in Maine, where you are, there's a huge booming industry. Atlantic Sea Farms, a lot of those boats that you mentioned earlier that you might, you might be seeing mm-hmm. um, are, are likely either kelp farmers or kelp related. Like the industry there is really taking off. Maine just broke their state record for kelp harvesting. I think they had 850,000 pounds of, of sugar kelp this year. So it's an interesting wow. new, new chapter that's beginning. Well, yeah. it's everywhere. You know, but I love I love it so much. Maine is such a special place. It truly is. You know, Location so um, yeah, it's it's insane. So, um, is there anything you want to plug or talk about, or maybe tell tell me? Oceano! Of- oh my God! So Oceano. I think like yeah. So I think <laughs> another great perk to this, especially the restaurants for fishery reach, is I've gotten to work with some of the greatest psalms all over the place right. right so like um 
Dan Barber and his, you know, a lot of these places and, and they, they talk about like pairing seafood, you know, with uh, specific types of wines. And when you were just describing how your vineyard and kind of like the marine fog and those type of things, there are definitely, yeah. when I speak to Psalms, they're always talking about how their seafood has a very specific type of wine. Um, things that grow together, go together. Exactly. Go together. Just yeah. Saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we, you can, Actually, I know my, this is our Chardonnay. We also make Pinot Noir. But the Chardonnay, I swear, it smells like oyster shells. Like, it's just amazing how you get, you pick up those notes in the wine because the grapes are influenced, you know, by by the climate yeah. and the air quality the soil. and all that. Yeah, it's limestone soil, sandstone, marine shale, and fossilized shells. So you'll have to... Um, hook me up and intro me to some of these like great sommelier that are interested in yeah. wines that go with seafood for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And have you reached on, everyone seemed to have pivoted. Um, but it seems like, so now obviously our restaurants in New York are just starting to come back to, right. uh, to life. Um, but did you guys end up doing a lot more like direct to consumer it sounds like? We did a little bit more, but you know, our company is somewhat new. Even though we started in 2016, that wine wasn't to market until 2018, 2019. And so from 2019, um, you know, we had a killer year selling, but we mainly sell to restaurants and retailers, mainly restaurants. And it's mainly in New York City because I live there, but in different parts of the Eastern seaboard and then also uh, in California as well. So we we took kind of a hit, you know. I you know, I don't have a brick and mortar um, tasting room location. I, I do all of my stuff through, you know, word of mouth connections off of our website if it's direct consumer. So we we took a pretty hard hit, but now we're coming back. Um, we have some, like I said, great accounts in the city that really support us right now. You'll find our magnums of Chardonnay are being poured by the glass at Bergdorf Goodman, which is always, you know, a lot of fun. Nice. And also is they're served at Ocean Prime and, and Oceans and um, Kaima and a lot of really, uh, really seafood focused uh, restaurants. But yeah, it was tough. Um, but it's but it's getting better. And you know what? It's all good. You know what I'm saying? So to, what about you? How did it Yeah, well, it's so, it's so interesting, right? Because if you look at this like spectrum of ingredients in the world or um, like seafood is probably the most highly perishable. It has no shelf life. Mm. Like the, like literally the moment you catch a fish, this clock is ticking. It's almost like an hourglass has turned upside down. It's this race to get it as fast as you possibly can to its end place. Um, and I always will use that as like the foil against wine, which like ages well, right? So your wine, right. if you're sitting on it, right. it's actually like getting better as it gets older often. So right, right, to a point, but but for sure, I wasn't stressing out, you know, I knew the <laughs> yeah. wine would still be good, right? Yeah. And then I think the pandemic, it also seemed like people were drinking a good amount more. There was a lot more day oh, drinking. Oh, just a ton. There was a, a lot ton, of morning drinking. A lot. <laughs> yep. There was a lot so, of morning drinking. Yeah. Yep. So, um, so yeah. But so things we, are we're in the same boat. Better. Like Google, I mean, Google Corporation reaches our biggest institutional client. Um, and they have 7,000, they had 7,000 employees at their Chelsea campus, entire city block. Um, and all those Googlers used to have like Dr. Dish fish pretty much every day at lunch and like amazing. Yeah. So, so now we're kind of like staying synchronized with their, um, with their return, which is kind of staggered. They're doing it kind of slowly. Um, so we're, I don't predict that we're going to be back to our full pre pre pandemic kind of might or status. I would guess I'm thinking probably like, this time next year, like late spring of next year, by the time Google is back and reopen all the restaurants. Yeah. We're also having this interesting, um, I think the roaring 20s came after the last pandemic and yeah. we're having this yeah. really interesting kind of like hedonistic party of scene, especially in the Hamptons. Uh, of oh kind yeah, of like, for yeah, sure. Yeah, it's beginning where the roaring 2020s um, have begun. So the restaurants are definitely- Roaring 2020s? To, oh, I like that. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that the restaurants <laughs> are starting good. to come back, but the 
corporations and institutions, you know, life has changed definitely. And, and corporate yeah. life, New York City, the whole pre pandemic identity of New York City, we're now, I'm like kind of meeting a new city in a lot of ways. And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. like this is all different, all new um, and changed. And there's just so much updating going on. Yeah. So I'm pretty confident. If anything, though, in seafood, you we are always adapting and finding ways um and kind of versatility is is kind of baked into our cake so um yeah i'm looking forward to it i think it's going to be exciting people are always looking for really good wine they're always looking for really good fish so i don't think uh you know i have i have the we have bright spots on the horizon as far as i can see yeah i feel the same way sean you know good things ahead good things are coming ahead uh, we didn't make wine in 2020 because we weren't selling wine, so why am I gonna make wine? Um, but we are in 2021, so we're coming back strong in 2021 for for another vintage coming on. And and I noticed that people really like Magnums. I mean, maybe it had something to do with drinking in the morning, I have no <laughs> idea, but we'll be bottling a lot more Magnums. And then I realized cool. that, um, yeah, half bottles too, but um, I just really can't thank you enough for coming on. And, it's awesome to see you. Are you, yeah, are you, you at too. your house in Montauk right now? I'm, no, I'm actually, we built a fish, uh, fly fishing cabin up here in the Catskills in Dubuque. Oh, so fun. This is, yes, this is our, um, our Catskills fly fishing uh, little lodge up in uh, Dubuque, New York by Livingston Manor. So, but I'll be back. We have a big event this week. I'll be back in um, uh, Montauk this weekend and we have a big event next week in Southampton actually with David Barber. Um, okay. And some really, it's a uh, sustainable seas event at the Southampton Art Center, and it's Fish and Men is this. We we did this really cool documentary uh, that they're screening the documentary. So get this, how cool is this? They oh. were like, yeah, we want to put together a. We want to. They have a big outdoor theater at the Southampton Art Center. Like we want to screen the film Fish and Men, and you, Sean, can put together a speaker panel. And pick all like your favorite fisheries people. So I was like, oh my yes. God, what? Yeah, so I got all, like, this really kind of dream team, like my X-Men of like cool, uh, the dream team of fisheries folks. So yeah, that's on the 7th, um, okay. uh, July 7th. So I don't know, or 8th, I'm sorry, next, a week from Thursday. So when are you back in the New York area? I'd love to catch up. The 6th. I'm oh, there really? the 6th, yeah. Well, I'll send you the come. invite for the Southampton <laughs> Arts Center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be weather permitting. I have also, a, it's right. weather permitting. Yeah. Yeah, that'd so, be awesome. I have a friend who lives in Southampton. So I have a cool. place to crash, too. Sweet, sweet, <laughs> sweet. I'll send you all the info. And hopefully, if the weather agrees, it should be a really cool night. It starts at 7 yeah. o'clock. It's out on the lawn. I've been to a few of the, they've had a series of these events uh, in the spring and summer. And it's just really nice just be out on, you know, at a kind of an outdoor movie theater. Yeah. Like just, uh, yeah. yeah. It's so cool. So send me cool. the invite. I'd love to. Will do. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, thanks again, Sean, for coming yeah, on. You're amazing. You, Sean Ray. Barrett, back to dish, doing good work. All right, stay everyone, stay take care. Thanks, guys. Okay, cool. Ciao. Bye.